Well, good evening and welcome to the Father Greg McLeod Lecture Series. My name is Father <laughs> Douglas McDonald, and I'm the chaplain here at CBU. And uh, I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we explore an important topic on how food insecurity impacts our whole life. Today, I would like to explain just a little bit about how the evening will run. And then I will invite someone to introduce our two special guests. And so I would like to let you know that we'll have a, a time for questions at the end. So a student from the Newman Society House, uh, known as the Father Greg McLeod House, he donated his personal home to the students and they live and live in his home. And one of the people who run the home as the, as the student leader and also a CBU student, she will be giving the introduction to our two uh, guest lecturers. And then immediately following that, Dr. Brian Joseph will speak, followed by Ms. Taylor Anthony. And then we will, I will jump in and I will facilitate questions. And you're welcome to message me on the chat thing if you're not comfortable speaking out loud and I can read your question for you. After the question period in which uh, our, our lecturers will answer your questions, uh, there will be another student from Cape Breton University um, from India. She will be uh, giving the official thank you on behalf of the Greg McLeod Lecture Series. So that is sort of how the evening will unfold. Uh, if you haven't already, perhaps you could hit your mute button. That way there's no background noise. And in case your phone rings or some, you know, something in the background interrupts our speakers. So if we all hit mute, we're good to go. And uh, if you, for some reason, know of someone who can't be here tonight, but they wish to take it in, you can let them know that this, will, this lecture will be recorded and posted on the Newman Society YouTube page. So the Newman Society, you type in that at YouTube and believe it or not, the Cape Breton University New, Newman Society named after Cardinal, St. Cardinal John Henry Newman, uh, little old Cape Breton is like the first page right at the top. So I don't know how we land at that with all the Newman societies around the world, uh, but there we are. Before I introduce Betty to give our introductions, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of articles on Father Greg and the co-op movement that are being uh, circulated these days. Uh, one gentleman from the University of Glasgow, Colin Mason, did a uh, case study on the, the actual economic model and process that Father Greg has used to help bring about uh, innovation and economic success in rural communities. Father Greg's particular process and methodology is uh, being researched in different parts of the world and being incarnated and used in other places. So it's good for us to recognize uh, that uh, someone such as Father Tompkins and Father Moses Cody uh, have influenced our, our planet in the co-op movement, but also Father Greg as his particular uh, thoughts and economic models are being uh, realized and activated in other places. With that, I would now like to invite our first uh, speaker. And Betty will be coming to us from India. Her name is Betty Mangala from the Newman House. Betty, I invite you to introduce our special guest lecturers. Thank you, Father. Uh, so first, I'm welcoming Dr. Brian Joseph. He's a native of North Sydney, attended town school, St. Francis Xavier University, the University of Toronto, and Harvard University. 
He was a top prize winner at age before returning home to Cape Britain to help found Cape Britain University. At CBU, he was a lead designer of the new university's first degree program, Bachelor of Arts in Community Studies. Subsequently, seconded to public service, he led a federal provincial review of the administration of criminal justice in Nova Scotia. Preparatory to the Marshall Inquiry, before serving as special advisor in the Privy Council Office, Ottawa, under Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Dr. Joseph has had a long and committed engagement with both legal and social justice and served as a founding board member at New Dawn with New Dawn founder, Dr. Greg McLeod. He was regional chairperson for the Canadian Catholic International Development Organization, Development and Peace, and was a CIDA advisor in Central America. He was chief expert witness in the Supreme Court case establishing the Acadian School at all the Acadia in CBRM and led the program design and federal funding for the Drug Dependency Treatment Center of the Native Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counseling Association at Eskasoni, Cape Britain. In Central America, he led the international funding by Canada, Japan, and Denmark for the Graduate Environmental Studies Faculty and the University of Central America in Managua, Nicaragua. In 1985, Dr. Joseph and Father Greg led the first group of CBU students ever to travel abroad when they journeyed to Spain to study the Basque Cooperative Movement. One of these pioneering students from Dr. Joseph's third year BSc seminar later became head of Neuron and her daughter Tania Brand Barrett currently serves at CPU as Associate Vice President, Academic and Research. One of Dr. Joseph's first BSc student public interest research group projects exposed excessive food price hikes in CBRM among food retailers and associated food wholesales here. Dr. Joseph is joined by his fellow social justice advocate and food safety security researcher, Ms. Taylor Anthony, a current student at CBU and at Acadia University, whom he credits for reviving his interest in the problem of food security and food insecurity. So I'm welcoming Taylor Anthony. She's a 23-year-old university student from Cape Breton, New Scotia. She's completing a bachelor degree at Cape Breton University with her major concentrating in psychology and environmental science. Taylor, having grown up in an upper middle class family, was sheltered in many ways from hardships that many lower, lower class families face. In recent years, Taylor has come to learn just how many people struggle to get by and this knowledge has inspired her to want to draw awareness and hopefully one day bring about changes to how society is structured. The acting result of such inspiration can be heard in Taylor's discussion of food insecurity and how the accessibility of this life necessity is not always present for many people. Thank you, thank you and welcome for this series, lecture series. Thank you very much, Betty. Very well done. And with that, we turn the baton over first to Dr. Brian Joseph. Thank you, Doug. And good evening, dear friends. Thank you for joining us for this memorial Dr. Greg McLeod lecture, focusing on food insecurity and its many ramifications. A special word of thanks to Cape Breton University Chaplain, Father Doug McDonald and his CBU Newman Club Committee who have organized this year's lecture and also to my co-presenter, Ms. Taylor Anthony, who has done so much to bring this topic to the fore in our community. 
If you missed her Cape Breton Post editorial piece, we will include it in a list of follow-up resources for you. Thank you also to Betty for her kind and very generous introduction this evening. The focus of this year's lecture, How Food Insecurity Affects One's Whole Life, points to just how immense this topic is. To get a better handle, we will explore many different aspects of the problem, both local and international. But before we begin, in honor of the person this lecture is dedicated to, I'd like to share with you a little story about Father Greg McLeod, in whose memory we offer this presentation. Father Greg was an important mentor in my life, a dear friend, and later a professional faculty colleague at CBU. I'm grateful for this opportunity to celebrate his life and his good works together with my co-presenter, Miss Anthony. When I was a student at Xavier Junior College many centuries ago, Father Greg McLeod was a very young professor, one of the breed of new European trained faculty who returned to Cape Breton <laughs> full of excitement and enthusiasm for the future of university education here. Together with colleagues like the late Dr. Charles McDonald, Greg brought an almost incandescent energy to the scene, whether in his classroom teaching, his starting the Celtic music revival, his support for the college pub in the old low garage on George Street in Sydney, or his founding of the New Dawn Community Development Corporation. Greg had enjoyed the wonderful opportunity of studying at Louvain University in Belgium and also at Oxford in England. His wide ranging continental study and travel left a permanent international stamp on him, which continued to bear fruit and inspire new interests and new projects from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico to the Mondragon co-ops of the Basque country in Spain. One year, while I was teaching in the early days of CBU, I happened to have an all-female third-year BACS seminar group. They were researching youth unemployment in Cape Breton. We were looking at opportunities for young people to start their own business, perhaps as cooperatives. It happened that year that Greg was leading a study tour of Canadian co-op business executives to visit the Basque co-ops in Spain. When I inquired of my students if they might be interested in traveling with Father Greg to Spain, they were initially quite incredulous. And we did not know if there was room for a group of CBU students or if they would be welcome. I walked down the hall. Greg was in the middle of a philosophy class. I put the question to him. He was immediately open in, to the idea, but cautioned that the trip would be very expensive. Somehow, all the students raised the large sum necessary to pay airfare and accommodation. And as you heard a few moments ago in Betty's introduction, they became the first group of CBU students to study and travel abroad. Those privileged to have known the late Reverend Dr. Greg McLeod, and even better to party with him, will also have many joyful memories of music and dancing at his home on the Esplanade, the current Newman House. Who else in Cape Breton had a copy in those days of Alan Stivell's fabulous Renaissance of the Celtic Harp from Cap Breton in France? Of that album, one reviewer wrote, people who hear this record are never the same again. Renaissance of the Celtic Harp is one of the most beautiful and haunting records ever made by anybody. To call this music gorgeous and ravishing would be the height of understatement. There aren't words in the English language to describe this record adequately. In many ways, the same could be said of Father Greg himself. You were really never the same person after you met him. And words fail to capture his energy his generosity, and his fierce joie de vivre. A 
Above all, Greg believed that when people of goodwill came together and combined their differing talents to serve the public interest, then good things could happen. The existence of Cape Breton University, of New Dawn Community Development Corporation, and the strength of the Celtic music tradition here now are proof he was right. In my college days, we hitchhiked from our homes around Cape Breton to what was then Xavier Junior College, a forerunner of Cape Breton University. XJC in time became Xavier College, then St. of X Sydney, later still the College of Cape Breton, the University College of Cape Breton, and finally, after much work and many struggles, Cape Breton University. <coughs> Father Greg McLeod was one of the leading champions in the long, hard fight to recognize Cape Breton's need and right to have a university of its own. Today's CBU students may not realize what a tough uphill battle it was to cut the strings of paternal control from our sister institution in Anakinish, to battle other maritime universities for our independence, and to convince a Nova Scotia capital that we needed and deserved a university of our own. Thank you, Greg, for the moral vision, the strength of character, and the irresistible perseverance which helped birth our own Cape Breton University. Truly, you showed us in the words of this young university's motto that perseverance will triumph. Now to our topic. My portion of this presentation is dedicated to the memory of Michael Beliveau, late of the Maritime Fishermen's Union. With Mike, I had the privilege of working at the first Mi'kmaq owned business in Nova Scotia four decades ago. Mike, your determination in fighting for social justice is a continuing inspiration. I will begin by proposing what some may consider a provocative thesis, but one I think Father Greg would strongly agree with. Namely, that the problem of food insecurity is at its root a moral problem. Not a production problem, not a distribution problem, not an agricultural problem, not even a political problem, but a moral problem. When considering food security and food insecurity, there are many possible frameworks we could use, many different perspectives we could take. And we will not be able to cover them all here. For example, we will not analyze the impact of cyber attacks on our food distribution networks, as may have happened to some local grocery stores this month. Nor will we examine the dreadful state of Canada's food labeling laws, regulations which make it very difficult for Canadians to know where their food really comes from. In the time available, I will offer some macro or big picture moral and historical perspectives. I'm fortunate to be sharing this presentation with an inspiring young food security advocate. Taylor will focus on the Canadian scene explore the many dimensions of food insecurity, and offer some possible solutions to the problem. In the third portion of our presentation, we will welcome audience questions, comments, and suggestions. I'd like to begin with some moral perspectives drawn from the theological tradition that shaped Father Greg himself, namely Catholic teachings on social justice. It may surprise many that these ideas have recently been strongly recommended by none less than World Bank economist Jeffrey Sachs as a route out of our current permacrisis, or what he calls our current global cul-de-sac. In this moral tradition, pre-capitalist and somewhat anti-capitalist, the view was taken that the Earth's resources are the common inheritance of all, a tradition very much in keeping with the more communal culture 
of Canada's Indigenous peoples. So while the right to and usefulness of private property as a defense of individual human dignity is upheld, that right is always limited in principle to advancing the common good. This is a middle ground position, similar to the constitutional principles enshrined in Canada's Bill of Rights, wherein many personal freedoms are subject to reasonable limits designed to protect the larger common good that is defined as the public interest. Within this theological, philosophical, and political framework, there is a strong inclination toward a guaranteed minimum equality of rights and opportunities. Of course, neither the authors of the classical papal encyclicals like Rerum Novarum or Populorum Progressio, nor the custodians of Canada's twin legal systems, the French Code Civil or the English Common Law, foresaw the current crisis in food security that we now confront. That took the inspired vision and moral courage of the next generation of young Canadians, young persons like my colleague, Ms. Taylor Anthony. So I look forward later in our presentation to learning more from Taylor about the personal roots of her concern for this now very urgent problem. For I am much indebted to her for bringing the urgency of this problem to my attention some three years ago when the food price crisis had not yet reached the public agenda and was still far below the horizon of our mass media. Now here's a challenge image for you to figure out while we proceed. I hope you can see that image. What is this and why does it happen? We'll return to this picture in a few minutes. Recently, I watched an interesting panel discussion about the problem of food security sponsored by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO. There were four panelists. The former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture suggested that the global food security crisis was a political problem. The head of the largest U.S. food retailer, any guesses? Walmart. Walmart. Walmart suggested it was a technical problem. The representative of the huge U.S. government international aid organization, USAID, suggested it was a coordination problem. And the head of a farmer's NGO organization claimed it was a people empowerment problem. Because the question of food security and its mirror image, food insecurity, is so large and complex, there are plenty of people, places, and things to blame for the problem. But behind all these plausible causes, politics, technology, coordination, empowerment or disempowerment, I believe that food insecurity, like the larger question of international and local economic inequality, is at its root a moral problem. We know the Earth's productive capacity is capable of producing enough food for all even in the face of continuing soil degradation, ocean pollution, and rapid climate change. We can admit that there are huge problems of waste at home and abroad. A third or more of all food produced is wasted in wealthy countries and stores and homes, in developing countries in fields and defective storage. For example, in India, where I recently spent four years, a shocking portion of all grain harvested is eaten by rats in defective storage facilities. We can accept the need for better technology, fair pricing, and an end to special interest politics, particularly in the US and Europe, where special deals to keep powerful farmers and agricultural lobbies happy limit production. We can also sympathize with the need to give growers everywhere 
especially in developing nations, more say in how their crops are produced, priced, processed, and marketed. But if we look at how major societal problems have been addressed in the past, from slavery to forced childhood marriages, to votes for women, to drunk driving, to tobacco use and lung cancer, and so on, we will find that the breakthroughs were not chiefly reliant on new technology or even new politics. The key thing needed was a new vision of the problem, beginning with the deep realization that there was a problem, that it was wrong to allow it to continue, and that therefore something needed to be done. And that is why I believe that food insecurity with its many ramifications through our personal and national life is at its root a moral problem. We have not yet faced up to its true causes, nor the need for deeper structural change in society and in the production, distribution, pricing, and availability of food. Leading economists of international development like Jeffrey Sachs have summoned the courage recently to admit that the root problem of economic development and poverty is a moral problem. And it is through ethical reflection and a radically altered moral vision of how modern economies should work that we will find in Sachs words, a way out of our current global cul-de-sac or dead end. I suggest to you that when it comes to making good food available to all, we are still in the moral dark ages. Like healthcare was in Canada before Medicare, when you got medicines or a doctor, only if you could pay for it or as charity. Does anyone in our audience today believe that slavery was right? That forcing young girls to marry against their will at the age of 12 or 13 or even younger, as still happens in some developing countries is right? No. Smokers no. have the right to pollute whole buildings and everyone else's lungs? Or that having only men mm -hmm. own property, settle court cases and elect governments makes any sense? then why should we accept that only some people have access to the food needed to live? Then why should we accept that only some people have access to the food needed to live? Not just any food, but healthy, nourishing, safe food that will give parents and their children the energy and nutritional elements needed for life. We know from good medical research done here in Canada at McMaster University and elsewhere that poor nutrition stunts a baby's long-term growth, depresses intelligence levels, and robs them of life's opportunities. It leads to negative impacts, not only for the affected children, but also for the societies in which they live. There is a new paradigm for practicing pediatric medicine beginning to develop in Canada and the United States. It's known as social pediatrics. It takes pediatricians out of their offices and into the homes of low income and other vulnerable children. When Dr. Nicholas Steinmetz, former director of the Montreal Children's Hospital and a Canadian pioneer of social pediatrics, visited low income homes in Montreal, he found slices of bread framed and hanging on the walls of one apartment. When he asked about this, he was told by the children's mother, that's our art. Shamefully, Canada has more children living in poverty than any Western country except the United States. Hardly something to be proud of. So why, if there is plenty of food to go around, can't we get this right? I hope you're ready to have your thinking challenged this evening. I hope you're willing to help start a moral revolution. If so, we will begin by taking a look at the legal history of modern food and other large corporations. These unelected giants, which in our time stand astride and over 
most national governments, originally began as special concessions to build roads and mines for feudal kings. In return for this public service, they were granted special privileges, special immunities, and even legal personhood. It is astonishing that for hundreds of years, while women were not considered persons in the white man's law, incorporated groups of ambitious men, often with very dangerous plans, like exporting slaves from West Africa to the American colonies to harvest tobacco, cotton, sugarcane, were accepted as legal persons. Multinational corporations now control more wealth than many national governments. And in almost all nations, they are a dominant political force in determining what gets done and what is not done. As examples, think of the recent SNC-Lavalin scandal at the Privy Council in Ottawa, a very rare expose of the long hand of corporate power on our elected officials and a look behind the curtain of business as usual that unfortunately supports the Federal Law Reform Commission finding that too often we have one law for the rich and another for the poor. Or check out the disastrous consequences of the Koch brother corporate influence on recent American politics. Or review the history of the Michelin Bill in Nova Scotia that prevented rubber workers exercising their rights or ask what ever happened to the majority vote of the people of Nova Scotia against Sunday shopping. This problem of unelected anti-democratic commercial interests dominating and subverting public policy is not limited to Canada. A particularly tragic example of corporate wrongdoing and big power colonization is seen in the continuing specter of hunger in Haiti. There, the predecessor of the French bank Credit Industriel et Commercial and the predecessor of the U.S. Citibank, in the words of a New York Times special 2022 <laughs> investigation, and I quote, wrecked Haiti at gunpoint installing a puppet government, dissolved parliament at gunpoint, entrenched segregation, forced Haitians to build roads for no pay, killed protesters, and rewrote the nation's constitution." End quote. More recently, similar French and American corporate interests, with the aid of the French and U.S. government, helped remove a democratically elected president Father Jean-Bertrand Aristide. He had dared demand France and the US repay the approximately 115 billion, that's billion with a B, extracted at gunpoint from Haiti between 1825 and 1947. What National Public Radio in the US called the greatest heist in history. Father Aristide was forced into exile in the far distant Central African Republic. Today, he lives under the protection of the post-apartheid government of South Africa. As the New York Times put it in part four of their 2022 special investigation into hunger and poverty in Haiti, quote, invade Haiti, Wall Street urged, and the US obliged, end quote. And many still ask why Haiti, once the most prosperous colony in the New World, I'm going to repeat that, once the most prosperous colony in the New World, with apartments more expensive than those in Paris, is starving today. The 2022 New York Times part, part or five part rather, special report titled, The Root of Haiti's Misery, Reparations to Enslavers is not for the faint of heart. Oh, and that challenge image shown earlier? Those are mud pies sold as food in Haiti. 
for many they are one of the few ways to fill empty stomachs and hold off starvation. More recently and closer to home, consider the dishonest maneuvers of Canada's big grocery store chains, pretending to freeze or lower food prices while gouging consumers and stuffing their pockets with fattened profits in what the British Broadcasting Corporation labeled Canada's greedflation food scandal, all the while claiming that, quote, good food is not a privilege, but a right to quote an advertising slogan from a local grocery chain. You can see the advertising slogan on that bag now, I believe. Of course, bad behavior by corporate giants like Empire or Loblaws, grain giants like Cargill, or fertilizer seed giants like Monsanto is just part of this complex problem, as the impact of the current war in Ukraine on global food supply makes clear, or the tragic deaths from starvation occurring now in Tigray as a result of the civil war in Ethiopia. Those deaths really hit home personally because when I was teaching at CBU, I had a refugee from that war in Tigray living with me in Sydney. Given the inordinate influence which large corporations have over democratic politics in Western countries, while they are only a part of this complex problem, they are an important part of the problem because any effective policy solution to food insecurity will require government action and governments hobbled and hemmed in by powerful lobbies of big food will simply be unable or unwilling to take action that is necessary. Nonetheless, because there are good people, a people of goodwill and vision everywhere, it can be important and especially effective to recruit the leadership of large corporations to support progressive causes. Greg McLeod has special gift for this. An example is the growing practice of ethical sourcing of coffee beans by the large fast food coffee chains in Canada and the US. If you get the big guys on board, you can make a big impact. Yet we need to remember a warning from the father of free market economics. Adam Smith warned us in a much neglected portion of his famous Wealth of Nations Quote, keep commercial interests far from the process of lawmaking. They have no interest at heart but their own. So perhaps it is time that Canada's large food monopolies and oligopolies excuse me, were regulated as the public utilities they really are. For it's not just in Russia that we find subversion of government by wealthy oligarchs. Granted, it is one thing to bemoan the loss of democratic control over public policy at home and abroad. It is another thing to figure out practical possible solutions to a food insecurity crisis that is forcing families to choose between paying their rent or eating supper. So what in practical terms can we do to get a handle on this problem and fix it? We've learned some valuable lessons from public policy initiatives and program evaluations done elsewhere. Most important of all, we have learned that public policy interventions can make a powerful difference. In this regard, programs to address food insecurity in Newfoundland, Labrador, in British Columbia, and in Brazil under the government of Lulu Ignacio da Silva are particularly encouraging. In all three cases, low income families were provided extra income and researchers found that there was a sharp drop in food insecurity. We'll provide some of this research for you in a resource list available from Father Doug. The social democracies of Scandinavia have also demonstrated the essential importance of a strong and comprehensive social safety net. Some of their lessons have been picked up in the new Hunger Count 2022, released by the Food Banks Association of Canada, titled Hunger in Canada from a Storm to a Hurricane. And you can see, I believe, 
the uh, policy section of that report on your uh, on your screens now. For as valuable as neighborhood food banks are, even those most involved recognize they are not a permanent solution. For that reason, the Food Banks Association of Canada has called for urgent action. One, to provide all Canadians an adequate minimum income. Two, to construct affordable housing. Three, to improve wages and working conditions for low-income workers. And four, to meet the special needs of remote communities. Research done at the Department of Sociology in Oxford University show it is especially important to assure all workers actually do receive a living wage. The following graph, based on data from 21 developing countries, shows the connection between a gap in wages paid employees versus the price of food charged and the occurrence of food insecurity. That diagram, full of dots with a line through the scattergram, shows that the larger the gap is between what workers are paid and the cost of food, the greater the increase in food insecurity across 21 European countries. It's a really interesting study because it covers many different kinds of government regimes and many different kinds of welfare uh, um, systems, and we'll get that to you as well. In addition, for program experience and research done in the US and Europe, we have learned that simply throwing money at the problem may not be enough. That experience and research should, suggests that financial aid needs to be carefully tailored and well aimed to, to take into account the demographic and situational factors of the recipients. Several of these factors can blunt or even nullify direct financial aid. Some of the factors decreasing the effectiveness of food support payments are alcohol, drug, or tobacco dependency, inadequate housing, unemployment or underemployment, income insufficiency, that's often due to low wages paid for full-time work, mental illness, physical disability, or chronic health conditions. These same factors also play an important role in producing the need for food supports in the first place. They do this often by hampering a person's ability to work and earn needed income. As with so many other social problems, good jobs remain key to solving our food security crisis. For a deeper look at the overwhelming importance of good work with fair wages, there is no better guide than Pope John Paul's encyclical letter, Laborum Exercens. Nothing in the technical literature of the social sciences comes close to matching it for insight and perspective. Highly recommend it. Perhaps Father Doug and the Newman Club committee members can help provide access to that encyclical letter. The full text is also available online with a good introduction available via Wiki. Now, before passing the torch to Ms. Anthony, here's a look at where Canada stands among wealthy nations in the occurrence of food insecurity, according to an OECD 2021 study. You can see, if you spot that red arrow about midway along the bottom, that Canada is roughly in the middle of the pack. We're far from the worst performers, but not yet in the leadership position that our wealth of resources and community values call for. So there is much work to be done. Now for more on the wide ramifications of our current food price crisis and possible solutions, I pass the baton to my own inspiration on this problem, Ms. Taylor Anthony. Over to you, Taylor. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to get my slideshow up. Just one moment there. Okay. 
So hi everyone, I'm Taylor. I'll be doing the second part of Brian and I's presentation on food insecurity. Um, so first I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backstory on how food security and food insecurity became of such interest to me. And this will help set the stage for my following discussion. It was a few years ago that I started to really think about and question the global food system. Like everyone, when they start to think about food in a more defining way, I was dieting. All my dieting consisted of was eating right, eating better. I wasn't becoming a bodybuilder or anything extensive. I was just starting to eat properly, which means eating healthy food and eating it often. I no longer had takeout numerous times a week and I stopped having junk food as snacks or partial meal fillers. Instead, I was making healthy home cooked meals. I was, let's say two weeks, about two weeks into doing this, which means two grocery orders into it because I had to go shop for food more often to keep this eating behavior up. And this is when I realized just how expensive it is to do so. And I thought, I am one person. How are people affording to feed themselves and their families properly? Thankfully, my parents are financially in a good place and I was still living at home at the time. So the grocery orders were a household thing and I didn't have to worry about trying to provide this food for myself all on my own. But I wondered how I would be able to afford this for myself and my own family one day. I care so much about this issue, food insecurity, and want to be able to provide and afford a healthy lifestyle for myself and I want the same for others. This sentence, be able to afford a healthy lifestyle, it's questionable in itself because the fact that you have to be able to afford to live healthily, it's not right. And this is where things really took off for me and my drive to want to bring about change to the food system. Because once I started thinking about it and researching it, I learned just how interconnected the food system is with almost every single aspect of people's lives. And this is globally, so no matter where one lives, the food system impacts them. And I'm going to go into detail on just how the food system exactly does so. So first, what is the food system? The food system is the production, processing, distribution, and consumption of food. Each of these four components all have a responsible place in critical societal systems and how they produce additional outreaching effects. We are going to look at how society, individuals, the government, families and home life, the workplace, the economy, and the environment are all influenced by food. And it is these many domains that I just mentioned that influence whether you are food insecure or secure. I'm now going to show a video by the Blue Cross Shield of Michigan of food insecurity so that you have a good idea of what it consists of. What if you had to make the choice between meals and medicine, between groceries and gas? Oh, sorry about that. Cut out on me. Um, I'll try to upload it again. What if you had to make the choice between meals and medicine, between groceries and gas? That is the reality for one in nine Americans who are food insecure. Simply, this means they lack consistent access to nutritious, affordable food due to socioeconomic. Are you sharing your screen, Taylor? People who are food insecure may skip. I am sharing my screen. Can you guys not see it? You can see the video? Yes, I can see it. Okay, good, good. You can't see it, Father Doug? That's no, okay. It could be something on my end, as long as they can see it. That's good. I can, I can see it. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. Meals, ration their food, rely on cheap convenience foods, or face unfavorable trade-offs between food and other living expenses. But the burden of food insecurity goes beyond growling stomachs. It's linked to higher rates of chronic conditions, such as type 2 diabetes and hypertension, malnutrition, mood disorders and mental health conditions, obesity, and developmental risk in children. Food insecurity is rooted in poverty and continually affects low-income families. In Detroit, 48% of households are food insecure, 
despite 74 full-line grocery stores operating within the city. But food insecurity is not just an urban problem. It exists in rural communities too. For many rural counties in Michigan, access to healthy, fresh food is a constant struggle. In Alger County, for example, people have to drive up to 10 miles to get to a fully stocked grocery store. The U.S. produces more than enough food to feed the entire population. In fact, 40% of food goes uneaten. You see, it's not about more food. It's about getting the food to the people who need it the most. Sorry there that you can't see that, Father Doug. I'll share it with you at a later time. Okay, so again, the definition of food insecurity as defined by the US Department of Agriculture is a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. Two words here, healthy and active, draw on the bigger picture of societal interconnectedness that food insecurity and security are both closely tied with and how they reflect one's living behaviors. Let's break down the different dimensions that the food system impacts. From a simple glance at this diagram, we have a good understanding of how each element relates to the other. For society, families make up society, individuals then make up families. Workplaces are operated by individuals coming together. The government oversees and influences the way in which this work and functioning happens. And then the outer effects of all of this result in the state of our economy, as well as the environment. I want to note that while I am going to provide some educating facts in my discussion, I'm not going to bombard you with them. Rather, the intent of my discussion piece is to educate you on the food system by connecting the dots with knowledge that you already have to help you understand just how immense and life impacting it is if you are food insecure or secure. Food as a daily essential resource is a key factor affecting the quality of one's life. If we think about it, food can be thought of as a bodily extension that exists outside one's actual functioning body, but yet is needed for the body to function. So here we can think that just how you need your heart to pump blood throughout your body, you need something to energize your heart so that it can perform this function. And that something is food. You yourself have likely experienced a subtle feeling of emptiness in your stomach if you miss a, sorry, if you miss a meal, and this is only a single meal. Myself, I notice a difference in my performance at school and in completing coursework if I miss a meal. This can give us an easy idea on how impacting and detrimental people's health and lives are if they are food insecure. Nutrition continues to influence our development over the lifespan, and this is seen in quality of health, which outside of medical conditions and external environmental or social factors is a direct outcome linked to the quality of one's diet. So the old saying, you are what you eat, is relevant here. So if you eat healthy food, it is much more likely that you are healthy and living a healthy lifestyle too. We are first going to look at this in development. Looking at the diagram on the left here, we can read how food affects us and the many different consequences of inadequate nutrition over the lifespan. The first way food impacts us is through development. Before we are even born, food sets the stage for the rest of our lives. What our mother consumes needs to be in line with official health guidelines for nutrition intake during pregnancy. I won't go into detail on specific nutrition facts here, but those crucial vitamins and minerals the, the mother needs for her baby's health are found in high quantities and more expensive foods like fruits and vegetables, dairy products, pasta and fish, and chicken, some of which are listed in the chart on the right five foods linked to better brain power. I'll give you a minute at the end here to digest the information on this chart. If the baby does not reach certain nutrition levels by certain stages of their development, this can impact them for the rest of their life. Brain and bone growth, motor functioning, and low birth weight, to name a few, can be the sad outcome. And you can get the idea of how if the child starts off neurologically hindered, and unwell, that this then impacts them for the rest of their life as they grow and the opportunities available to them. 
This is why it really matters where we end up in life because our way of life impacts the next generation and the cycle continues and continues again. If your mother is food insecure, this is a consequence both her and her child must face. Not only is she unable to feed herself properly, but now she must worry about the same for her child. If her child is lacking, then he or she will have more obstacles and will need more resources and supports to help them. And this then becomes another worry and another stress on the mother, who in the first place was only struggling to provide healthy food. So just here, we can easily see how food plays a big role and impact in our lives. And this is at a time when we really have no control over which kind of lifestyle we are born into. And we are completely reliant on our mother and what she can provide. I'll let you read this slide over for a few seconds before moving on to the next. Now on to the individual. This branch stems off of development, like my discussion on the baby. This baby then grows to be a child and then an adult. And depending on the life situations this person was raised in, this individual will either be a victim of being food insecure by not having the means to choose healthy food, or they will be food secure, which is ideal, but sadly becoming more and more of a struggle for people to attain these days. As defined by the Food and Agriculture Organization, food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So here again, we hear those two words, healthy and active. Being food insecure or secure gives way to the resources one has available to give into their days. So are they healthy and active? And this becomes evident when people grow up and start trying to build their own lives. Here we look at a similar picture, but with a new take. We know that family and home life can be stressful trying to balance everything. But if we question some of the stress closely enough, we can see that one cause of this can be linked to food. Food is a necessity that is needed numerous times in our every day. And with its increasing prices to obtain it, can mean working longer hours, to earn the funds to do so. This impacts the family and home life drastically because if the parent or parents are working and must leave their children at care centers or with a babysitter, then this means less family time and fun time with friends or in the comfort of your home with neighborhood kids. Also, longer work time can lead to tiredness, easy agitation and feelings of stress. This can place the family in an emotionally vulnerable situation where the parents do not have the patience or time to properly be with their children such as in terms of helping with their homework, dealing with arguments that may arise, having personal talks which strengthens family bonding and the sense of family security. And this can lead to all family members eventually feeling unwell. While speaking of family and home life, I'm going to share a little story here about my dad when he was growing up. His father passed away when he was eight years old and this left his mother to raise him and his three siblings on her own. Things were tough and they didn't know if there was always going to be food in the house. His mom would babysit other people's children to make an income. Before Christmas one year, my dad told me that he remembers watching the parents of some of the children his mother babysat for pay her for the holidays, even though she wouldn't be watching their children. But because they did this, he knew that it meant that there would be groceries in the house over Christmas for him and his brothers and sister. He never forgot this, and he never forgot those parents and what they did. This was a moving story for me, and as much as I would have liked to have been able to hear it and think, well, this, that was then, this is now, and things are better these, day for, these days for people, I can't. I can't think this because, for one example, I know of some teachers at schools in Cape Breton who send students home with bread and bagels, granola bars and fruit stuffed in their school bags for over the weekend. Because those kids themselves don't know if there's going to be food present. This is happening today and it's happening close to home. We can pick up a discussion on this at the end if you like, but for now I move on to discussing the workplace. In the context of longer hours at work, 
turn the funds to provide those essential meals three times a day. Here we look at a priority we all must have unless we are extremely rich, a job. Every week, our days and our sleep are planned around our work schedule. We spend hours and hours, five days a week, if not more, with a role to fill in our job. This adds up and takes a toll on a, a, toll on a person, even when they are food secure. This means that someone who gets their proper nutrition and can refuel their calorie supplies whenever needed can still struggle to keep up with all of their tasks at work. We can get an idea then of how much harder it is for someone who is food insecure. Without proper nutrition, we are more sluggish, have low energy, brain fogginess, and poor, and poor concentration. When things become stressful at work, our body relies on its energy stores from nutrition to regulate us and help us manage through such obstacles. If we do not have these energy stores, then we do not have the internal resources to better help us function effectively and efficiently. It's sad really because the people who work the longest and do some of the harder, less ideal jobs are the ones who are struggling to earn healthy food, but they are also the ones who need it the most since their work can be so exhausting on their bodies and mind. So, so far we are piecing together how food itself impacts us in our state of health, as well as how food's role is very interconnected in our days if we take the time to just really think about it. Now on to society. We can bring all that we have looked at so far into a good perspective to see that our development forms our state of health as an individual. Then as an, as an individual, we come to bring who we are and what we have into our family and home. And then as people from all around, we come to form society. Society reflects us and we influence society. Right now, however, society's structure is struggling, which means that the majority, are, majority of people are struggling. When I say society's structure, what I'm referring to is the functioning or system that makes society run. It's way out of balance. People are giving more than they have to give. For example, like I previously said about how people are overworking to make ends meet. Another way, of course, in which society is lacking is the global way in which food is distributed. We have too much food waste for half of society, which has to do with its unaffordable prices. So it rots rather than gets bought and consumed. And then we have not enough food reaching the other half of society resulting in starvation. We need a change. You could think of many changes that need to happen in society today, but this one change, food, that I'm, that I'm emphasizing is a priority to be given attention to. Food is our energy and we are society's energy. It impacts us all and society won't be able to keep up if we cannot even afford to fuel ourselves, let alone our role and obligations to society. While on the topic of society, I want to mention some extra vulnerable populations when it comes to food insecurity. Indigenous peoples, single parent households, university students, and the elderly are all groups who are more vulnerable to living with food insecurity. Looking at the first diagram on this slide, we learn that over 50% of First Nations living on res reservations in Canada are food insecure. Over 28% of Indigenous living off reservations in Canada are food insecure, and only 11% of white people are food insecure. We then look at the next diagram, which compares household income and pover poverty rates between parent status. And we can see that single parent households are highest among the poverty rate. And living in poverty is directly linked to living with food insecurity. For university students, taking a look here at the map of Canada, we see quite large numbers of university students across the country who experience food insecurity. While Cape Breton University is not mentioned here, a close to home one is Dalhousie. The corresponding bar graph for this map depicts moderate food insecurity percentages in orange and severe food insecurity percentages in yellow. As shown, when we combine moderate and severe food insecurity percentages for Dalhousie, we are left with the shocking number that 46% of Dalhousie University students are food insecure. This is almost half of the student body. Turning to the elderly population, the chart showing percentages in the bottom right hand corner highlights that in 2019, a total of 14 older adults face food insecurity. 
Among them, 45% had fared to four had fared poor physical health and 24% had fared to poor mental health. This finding emphasizes again how our quality of food impacts our quality of health, both physically and mentally. Because most elderly live on a fixed income, such, such as their pension, this means that as the cost of living goes up, their pay does not, and this can be a main reason why healthy food is so unattainable for them. When we take into consideration all of these groups and the high numbers associated with how many of them are food insecure, it really makes us think, this is not right, this is not okay. Another topic area that is of significant importance when discussing the environment is when discussing the issue of food security is the environment. The map on the left shows different locations across Canada and the types of food grown in each area. Grain and seeds for oil, dairy, as well as different varieties of meat are the most common goods produced here. The map depiction on the right shows the impact of climate change related risks on agriculture. The colors signify different risks. So if you guys can see my mouse, this, this kind of grayish green area is all cropland. And the different colored dots all over it signify the different risks. So the, the dark blue signifies water scarcity. The light blue is in areas where floods and sea level rising are happening. The yellow dots show areas where desertification and droughts are. And one other I'll mention is the pink dots, which signify a loss of biodiversity. So we can see here just how many risks the agriculture industry is facing due to environmental conditions. I'll provide some further discussion on the environment because I think it is really important to emphasize just how important the state of our environment is to the state of society. We live in an environment that is the world. For food to exist for us to consume, it needs to be grown all over the world. However, our world as we once knew it is no longer that and instead is becoming more fragile and depleted land and water masses. Therefore, another reason why there needs to be change in the food system is because how it impacts the our environment, which ultimately impacts us. Land is becoming harder and harder to keep its soil fertile. This means that it is becoming harder and harder to grow food, which results in lower crop yields and more unsuccessful growing seasons. On top of this, we can look at the concept of food waste. Too much food waste takes place in society, and this food waste directly harm, harms the environment. In fact, approximately 7% of greenhouse gas is the result of food waste globally. While this number may seem small, it's important to acknowledge that greenhouse gases are 21 times stronger than carbon dioxide, which is a leading cause of global warming. Food waste is a major issue in first world countries, including Canada. In Canada, each year, roughly 2.3 million tons of wholesome food are wasted. This is equivalent to 6.9 million tons of carbon dioxide. This area, the environment, really illuminates just how interrelated and affecting food is. Now onto the economy. For any country to be successful, its economy needs to be successful. Canada has a successful economy but any change to the food system here is going to impact our economy. Because of how much food is a prominent staple in our everyday, it makes sense that our economy is thriving on food outlets. Ask yourself this, how far do you have to drive before you see a drive through or a restaurant? Probably not very far, if only a few minutes for most of us. Globally, fast food chains alone bring in, bring in over $570 billion. This is a tricky part of the problem solving because how do we restructure the economy so that it successfully still runs, but no longer from its thriving food chain sources. As much as the food industries bring in, however, food waste from so many food outlets contributes to a big financial loss too. In Canada, approximately $49 billion is lost each year from, the, from food waste. And sadly, this waste of food accounts for over half of the food produced as depicted in the chart on the bottom left, which shows a total of 58%. So this means that more food is being wasted than is consumed. 
The chart on the right shows different categories of the food system with corresponding percentage and weight for each on how much food is wasted in Canada. We see it adds up to a total of 58%. And following the arrow, we learn that over half, 32% of this could be salvaged food that goes to people in need. In addition to food waste effects on our economy, we can also think about the importing and exporting of food supplies and how we too must consider how we would better manage these processes. Keeping a successful economy yet changing the food system is going to be our biggest challenge because it is no small matter or clear path that leads to this resolution. Finally, let's discuss the important people who we need to convince to get on board for a change in the food system to happen the government. No major change in society is going to happen without government involvement. Our economy is the work of our government's choices and actions. This is another tricky piece to the puzzle because our economy in Canada is working. It is successful, but the issue arises here when we look at how our economy is working. It's working financially, but at society's citizens' cost. This is how we know change is needed. The scales will never balance. The economy always must take more than it gives but things are now at the point where, where people simply do not have the means available with the current price demands our economy asks. Again, as I have said before, food because it is so prominent in our day can be the change to bring relief in so many ways. The government needs to recognize this and see a way to solve the problem. We, live, we in our actions and through spreading awareness help demand this change, however, when it comes to us, no matter what we ask of the government, if no large general benefit is seen from our ways, then the government can easily, easily ignore us. But they cannot, however, ignore the environment. And it is the now evident effects of the state of our environment that is driving government members to take action and make changes, because they know that if they don't, our environment will not be able to supply or support our living habits anymore. And in return, our economy will crash. Us as the people are the most influential, but the government is the most authoritative. However, at the end of the day, it is the environment that calls all the shots and thankfully it is calling the government to be on our side. If we can change how the food system now provides to the government so that instead of the government bringing in every gain as it currently does, and instead starts working with the people that are farmers, stakeholders, business people, etc., then we all have the government, society and the planet winning. Simply, the triangle of different levels I show here would no longer be with the big guy government members at the top, taking all the benefits and controlling where change happens. It would be more of those on the bottom level, which is meant to depict non-government members like myself, who have less of a say, coming to work together with the government by having a stronger say on how change needs to happen. We need to have the skills balanced better in these areas and the place to start is with food security. I'm going to show a video now on food security by agriculture education to highlight how we want things to be. Hey, Sammy, what kind of movie are you doing? Read something real, not imaginary. I want. For some reason, it's making me have to click on it twice before it'll play. Let me know if it is not viewable. I saw all these nurses working so hard. It's crazy how generous and devoted these people are. But something struck me, and it was their scrub. There were just... Two Chinese characters for the word population are the character of a person and the character of an open mouth. Do you know how many people there are in the world today? For most of human history, our population increase has been slow and steady. But in the last 120 years, it has accelerated from 1.5 to more than 7 billion. Around 1 billion people, or 1 in 7, are chronically hungry. It is predicted that by the end of this century, we will welcome person number 11 billion. Experts agree the planet can definitely produce enough food for 11 billion, but they question whether we can do it in ways that are environmentally responsible and whether safe and nutritious foods will be distributed fairly. What we are talking about here is called food security. 
it's not a term you might have heard before, so let's define it. According to the United Nations, food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. There are four dimensions of food security, availability, access, utilisation and stability. We might like to explore these further. Australia is one of the most food secure countries. We produce enough food to feed the nation nearly three times over. But food security is more than just how much food is produced. For a country to be food secure, there needs to be a consistent supply of healthy food and it needs to be accessible to all. We already have enough healthy food to feed the world, but the problem is that it isn't distributed equally. You may like to discuss what constitutes healthy food and how it can be accessible to all the world's people. One potential piece of the puzzle is the re-emergence of local food systems in which food is grown, processed, packaged and consumed in the same community. There are lots of great examples of this, including Western Farms in Brighton, Tasmania, where food is produced for farmers markets and restaurants, including their own cafe in Hobart. You might like to consider the economic health and environmental benefits of local food systems. So, now you've started to think about food security, perhaps the two Chinese characters that make up the word population, that is a person and an open mouth, make more sense to you. Ultimately, we must balance people and resources. This is a challenge for agribusiness and consumers alike, but one I think we're up for. I have thrown a lot at you today, and so has Brian, but I hope you now have a better understanding of just how strongly food impacts our lives. Along with this, the most important takeaway I can give you is solutions. While there does need to be changes in the food system globally, we can't start by looking at the big picture to make changes. We must start at home, which for myself and Brian, and probably many of you listening, is in Canada. So my take on solutions, because that's what we want, right? Brian and I throw a bunch of knowledge and facts at you, hopefully spark a desire in you for change as much as we want it. And then we need to, of course, tell you what to do to make this change happen. I've really thought about this <clears throat> over and over. And you might be thinking, well, it's impossible. He just told us it's connected to everything and we can't change everything. While this may or may not be true, there are ways to make small changes that have rippling effects into changing the bigger picture. This is where I let you in on a little secret. Maybe you've already figured it out, maybe you haven't, but it's a key insight into how we change the food system. We are the food system. Our actions, our demands design how the food system will function. So because we are the food system and our voice influences such system, our ideas on ways to combat food insecurity matter. We need food to live, we really do. It's a basic life necessity. It is a right. We have a right to healthy food. I believe we do. And because I believe this, I think that it should be paid, at least in part, by the government if it can't be free. Yes, I'm actually going here and suggesting this, as impossible and crazy as it may seem. I do think it's possible for the food system to be changed. And I think a big part of this has to do with the government taking action and providing financial support to everyone for food. So how on earth does that work? Well, we have just seen a pandemic where our government provided monthly financial support funds that were accessible to almost everyone. I was even able to receive such support check. So my question is, could such thing as a monthly food support check exist? You might be thinking, how could the government ever afford to do this? Well, I have to thank Brian for my ammunition in answering this question because he helped me problem solve just one example of where the government could potentially have enough funds to do this. And here's what he found. In 2021 alone, $30 billion in tax income was evaded or unpaid by Canadian corporations. Brian did some math for me here and summarized that this amount of money would be equivalent to 300 new Cape Breton cancer centers, 
or 900 new Sydney libraries, or 25 new NSCC waterfront campuses, or 1,000 new high schools. Or if used for food support, this $30 billion could provide each Canadian family with over $2,000 in food assistance payments. This is a crazy finding and one major example of where money could be available. So here's a breakdown of what I'm thinking when I say food support payments and how it could work. My idea here is that a monthly food check will go to everyone. So everyone, whether it's needed or not, they would receive it. How to make sure people use the check for food and not other means. It would only be cashable at certain grocery stores. Access issues. People living in poverty are likely not to have a phone or bank account. So the post office could be a pickup place for those who don't have a phone or bank account. Research shows that this will work because additional income for food does make a difference. Research on unpaid corporate taxes shows that there is money available for a program for universal food support payments. The tricky question that I, I actually asked my dad about this and Brian said he asked his wife, Nancy, of how do we make sure the checks are actually used for food and they're not sold off for harmful means? So the simple answer to that is if people need it enough, they will use it. I have some additional solutions. So some additional ideas that you could do are to join or start a food garden. For one of my courses with CBU, our class did a field trip to Waikagama and partook in, help, in helping Judy Gugu and her husband Joe with their food garden, which aims to bring fresh and healthy food to those in the community who need it. Another option is to start or join a food club. An important piece of the puzzle is also focusing on your own consumption patterns and spreading awareness. Potentially joining organizations that help combat food issues in a number of different ways is another great starting point. The three organizations that I list here range from helping with school lunches, reducing waste, and then offering further volunteering options as well. Also, and I'm going to have to give a shout out to Father Doug for these next solution ideas because we had a practice session the other night and he provided these ones. So in trying to be more food secure with healthy food, you can find videos on YouTube for ways to make healthy, nutritious meals for cheap by using beans or lentils. And not only is this healthy food, but it's tasty food. The practice of trading goods is also very important. For example, if you have a garden and your neighbor, some you need no fishes, then you could do trade-offs. Or if you have apple trees or berry bushes, but don't like to cook or bake, but know someone who does, then maybe you could provide them with enough fruit to make a dish for both you and them. As Brian said, food insecurity is a moral problem. And to solve a moral problem, we need to make people care. Getting to know your neighbor and learning if and how you can help each other makes such a difference and is another solution idea with great importance. You never know how you may be able to help someone or how they might be able to help you. In closing, all I have to say is simple. We need a change in the food system, but that change can only happen if we care enough to educate ourselves, take action, and to do what we can. Part of you showing you care and doing what you can was by being here today and listening. So thank you all very much. And I hope that Brian and I have motivated you to do what you can in your own lives to bring about a more food secure world. Thank you very much, Taylor. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian. I would now like to open up the floor for anyone. Just unmute yourself and ask your question. And then would, as a former high school teacher, I ran both a breakfast club and literally a food bank at schools because so many of my students were coming to class hungry. And, you know, it was a high school. They were doing breakfast clubs at elementary school, but somehow when they got to high school, I guess they're not supposed to be hungry anymore. And if you know teenagers, they they can eat quite well. But I'm just wondering perhaps if we could encourage perhaps more schools 
you know, within this region to set up. Uh, and by the way, the Breakfast Club, you didn't come in with, you know, I'm poor, I'm coming in. It became, it was a natural social event. Students loved chatting with each other. And some of the students were probably, forgive me, economically secure, but they just enjoyed, you know, so I would never do this, forgive me, means test or anything else. But I think if we could encourage educational facilities, like, a, forgive me, a, any schools, you know, whether they do a lunch program or a you know, because if we can feed the students, they learn much better. That's all my comment. Okay. No, I think that's great. I think that's a, a great suggestion. Yeah. I like how you uh, emphasize to promote it as a social aspect rather than poor, yeah. I'll jump in here. Since Dr. Bryan identified this as a moral issue, mm -hmm. I think there's relevance there for a moral solution. And somehow all of us, churches, academia, schools, as you say, Tom, uh, the government, policy changes. All of us have to be educated, as Dr. Bryan spoke about. And uh, this is going to take a collective effort in solidarity. And then once that uh, will is there, the solution uh, can be incarnated. So no one sort of thinks of this as a moral solution or a moral problem. But uh, if Dr. Bryan's thesis is correct, that this is a, a moral problem, then uh, all of us have a responsibility to be participants in a moral solution. Is there anything more you could say about that, Brian? Like what we can do to be part of the moral problem solvers? Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Um, I received a piece of mail yesterday from an organization called Kairos. Uh, many of our participants this evening will know Dr. Tom Urbaniak, either because they've perhaps met him at the college, been fortunate enough to take a course from him, read one of his great books on conducting meetings and uh, encouraging public participation, or uh, have heard his commentaries, his outstanding commentaries on um, CBC, Halifax, or Sydney, or elsewhere. Tom and his wife um, have played a leading role here in Cape Breton before the pandemic in getting a chapter of Kairos organized. And there are many other community organizations that that offer an opportunity to really uh, put into action our, our concern for our neighbors and our concern for this problem. The churches are still in a position to, to play an important role, although uh, in many cases uh, attendance may be down or they may be facing uh, organizational challenges of their own but uh, particularly in the international area you've seen how the churches could come together and they've made a tremendous difference um, on the ground in projects um, that some of which i've seen myself in central america and so there may be opportunities here in cape breton to encourage a more ecumenical effort among uh, the churches and people of uh, different faiths because um, when we come together and we are we are open and willing to share our our concerns then as uh, father greg would encourage us you know good things happen um, you form a certain critical mass and i really like the example of the school program 
as well as <coughs> Taylor's comment because um, we're deeply social beings. We need each other and in each other we find uh, strength, encouragement and joy. So when we come together, it's also important to have fun. And uh, that's, that's having fun together. And Father Greg was terrific at getting people together to have fun. When we have fun together, we're really expressing our love and our concern for each other. And that gives us energy and encouragement that we need to do the, the tough work of making our moral concerns come alive through concrete action. So I would say, I would say to put it fairly simply, look for a community organization that uh, you feel comfortable with and that is capable of doing some work it may be a service club, it may be a church organization, it may be some other community organization, it could be an arts or culture organization. And uh, work through that organization with others, um, keep your passion and concern alive and, uh, and feed that and, in yourself and, and in others. And a big part of that um, is having fun and uh, for those with religious faith, a big part of that is also prayer. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I want to make a comment. I, I really enjoy Taylor and, and you too, Dr. Brian. I, before I watched the, tonight's series, I was very much aware of the need, especially in Cape Breton, to the point when I'm in a store and I'm putting stuff in my own car and somebody comes alongside of me, I, I'm thinking to myself, are you making a decision to put the stuff in the car or maybe in the oil tank? So I don't know if everybody knows about this one, but there's two communities that I can talk about in Sydney Mines and there's one in the Waterford. And it's just, just cabinets that were built on to the, the, the one in the Waterford. There's a cabinet on the side of the store in the Waterford. And so when I do my own grocery shopping now, just so that I don't feel guilty, because sometimes I feel guilty, I do. I can afford to buy the groceries, but I feel sorry for the people who I know who can't. So I buy, if I'm buying one thing for me, I'll buy maybe one or two. And when I can, I just take that stuff early in the morning so nobody will see me. And I put it in the food cupboard. That's totally non-denominational. I think it's a Christian thing that it and it it kind of eases my own conscience that I'm making a little bit of a difference. No, that's that's awesome. That's fantastic. I am um, I I hear you on the the guilty side because I I like to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but I so often see people pushing carts through the grocery stores, and it's a lot of cheap food, junk food in it. And I, I feel guilty as well. And, and that, that drives me more because I know there needs to be a change. It's, it's not right. Does anyone have a stat? There's a, Cape Breton has one of the highest child poverty rates in Canada, if not the highest per capita. Uh, Brian or, or Taylor, do you know what the, the rate of child poverty is in Cape Breton. I don't have exact numbers for that, but Brian Brian's more of a number guy. He would have he has so much knowledge in his head. It's just, but I don't know if he has it right now on the top of his head. <laughs> well, the sad thing is that uh, probably for fifty years, the rate of child poverty has been one in five in Canada. And it's, it's very disturbing to realize that when the National Film Board was still making films in black and white, they had this terrific film of a kid in Montreal stealing bread from a bread truck. And uh, I was using that film when I was teaching at St. Mary's in the 70s. And the rate of child poverty in Canada has not changed. That's five decades. I don't know what the uh, current figure is in Cape Breton. That, that would be a pretty easy look up off camera sometime. But uh, if we have uh, such a high rate, we're probably looking at something like two and five or double the national rate. 
I can jump in for a second. I have a relative who worked at Bell and he was sent from Halifax to the CBRM for over a month. He said he knocked on every door in Glace Bay, New Waterford, uh, North Sydney, Sydney Mines, and parts of Sydney. And he was shocked that he said, he was stunned at the level of uh, what he, he saw on the inside of their home was when they let him in. You know, the home may look okay on the outside, but there's nothing inside. And then when he would try and sell them a, a subscription, they, they, could, they had to decide, could I afford just internet or internet with television, cable? And then when they finally did decide to get just one or the other, they would fail the credit score and they couldn't even get the service. And from his deduct or inductive observation, Sydney Mines was the poorest of the, the CBRM. Because he was in the homes and he saw what went on. And he said many of the homes, no one actually lives there. Quite a few of the homes are, you know, they're, they're empty or they're summer homes. That's just to help with the statistics. Yeah, no, I, uh, that's where my dad grew up was in Sydney Mines. My mom too. So I, and I've heard it, it is, it's, it's one of the higher, higher rates of poverty there. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question for Taylor. <laughs> Taylor, first, I want to thank you for a really outstanding presentation. It was just oh. terrific to work with you on this. Well, thank you. The same goes to you. I, uh, I'm a nervous presenter and I tend to talk fast. So I hope that it was OK. But the same to you, Brian. Thank you very much. Now, my question, Taylor, you, you're uh, in the middle of your undergraduate studies and you have a great interest and concern about this problem and you're gathering information from many sources and in fact from more than one university yeah. which is which is terrific so as you gather this information and you learn from your professors and you learn from your own studies and reading what do you think is the most important thing that a group of concerned citizens like those with us this evening and those who may see the presentation later, what do you think is the most urgent, important thing that they should do and how can they do it? I think the first step would be definitely to educate yourself because I know I've seen lectures in the past where I didn't have much education on what the topic was and but the lecture still moves you to want there to be to help make a change. So I think for me, I would have to go back then and get, become more educated. So I think getting it, becoming educated, finding people who also share that drive to want to take, uh, make action, take a stand, um, spreading that awareness and, and looking into what you can do yourself and to, to join those bigger organizations when you're mm -hmm. able to make that commitment to help bring about, to bring about the change. What about you, Brian, if I throw that question back at you? Yeah, I would say uh, pretty close to my earlier response and your suggestion here, look for a community organization you're comfortable with um, and try to find a way to, to volunteer so that you're, you're actually involved physically and bodily if you're able to do that as well as through your reading and prayer. And I'd like to pass this question on, kind of like a baton that we're passing along to, to Father Doug. I wanna ask, ask uh, Doug what follow-up he'd like to see and what can he do as chaplain at CBU to help that happen? That's a good question. Um, ultimately, we need hearts to be inspired because when people care for one another charity and love is a natural extension and so in order to even care you got to know each other and so somehow that culture of encounter that we hear a lot about today in the church has to be built up and so just tonight all seeing your faces seeing 33 people that are 
interested in food security, uh, this is a, a first step. And uh, I don't know how it can, you know, what will happen from this, but I think all of us need to, at least in our own way, be conscious of the needs and uh, and do what we can to to incarnate charity and care for those in need. Uh, just the fact Winnie, when she has that self awareness to be conscious of someone in need, um, that's the that's a beautiful mindset to possess. And I believe the more we can can sort of come out of our own little worlds, because so often you know there's a gospel that you know, the person stores all this food in their house. Well, that's great for them, but what about your neighbor? Mm -hmm. You know, am I not, do I not have a responsibility to those in need? And everyone is my neighbor, not just my physical next door neighbor. And so I think maybe all of us in our own way uh, can start to care and love people more. And from that encounter with others, uh, I, I do believe things, good things can happen, but we have to care. It's got to come from in our hearts. And that's why I was really touched by your, your identifying of the problem being a moral problem, because thus really it is, it's a, it's a moral solution deep in our hearts. We have to love each other and care enough to do something about it. Speaking of doing something about it, Doug, is there some possibility that maybe the Newman Club at CBU could could join forces with uh, Kairos and people like Tom to to continue a conversation around food security and food insecurity in Cape Breton? It's a great idea. I'd be honored to. Yes, I had a chance to. Uh, I had a chance to work with Tom. In fact, my wife Nancy and I had volunteered before the pandemic to serve as secretary for the uh, for the Kairos organization. I must admit, we've sort of uh, lost uh, um, our momentum because of the pandemic. But I would be very happy to uh, to try to assist in any minor secretarial role that that could help the Newman Club and Kairos to uh, to continue this conversation. Wonderful. Well, with that, I'm going to hand the baton to our uh, next student from CBU, who's also part of the campus ministry team here at CBU Chaplaincy. Uh, her name is Shubi Agrawal, and I invite her to give the official thank you on behalf of the Father Greg McLeod Lecture Series. Thank you, Father Doug. Uh, I would really like to thank Dr. Brian and Taylor uh, you you both actually made me cry, um, especially uh, Dr. Brand when you showed mud pie being sold as food. Um, I think um, I think uh, this this is this is a time we really need to take it seriously and not just thinking so individualistic. Uh, imagine somebody eating that. Uh, it's so painful to know. It's very heartbroken. And um, and especially Tyler, as you said that, um, you know, when you were sh grocery shopping, you were able to afford it, but because you had parents to take care of it, you come from a family uh, who could support you. As an international student, I know how expensive groceries are in Cape Britain. And if I, if I go into statistics part, um, as a business student, I always put my <laughs> my uh, you know business aspects. If I see the statistics part, if I'm earning thousand dollars, just for exa example, my seventy percent goes as my rent. So I'm only left with thirty percent to take care of my groceries and other aspects. So what happens is the first thing you start compromising is your grocery because your rent is fixed right your your accommodation cost is fixed so these are all are the moral issues you know we really need to solve um as uh, dr brand you said that it's a moral issues basically we are moving to an individualistic uh, you know aspects uh, if uh, and 
uh, I don't know, means you are, have been researching in this as a normal uh, civilian. Um, what I believe, um, how we can change the moral aspect or moral understanding understanding of an individual is we need to teach our children, you know, at the school level that, hey, you need to share your lunch boxes or uh, share with your friends because that sharing has to be habit. And it becomes a little difficult when we are grown up to inculcate any specific habits. So we really need to go back to the basics and start teaching our children the importance of nutrition. That, hey, uh, muffin is good, but eat a banana in the morning because that's a natural fuel. So that level of um, you know, basic teaching is also, uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, way to walk towards it. Um, I was also reading um, Dr. Uh, Greg McLeod's lecture series, uh, the PDF which was shared by um, Father Doug. And one specific quote actually got my attention. It says, I cannot change the world, but I can change my backyard. So again, coming back to the basics, um, we all have got, got our backyard. And if we go back to the Jewish culture, in Jewish culture, uh, you were only allowed to harvest the center of your back, of your, you know, uh, field. The borders or the fences has to be left for your um, neighbors or anybody passing by can just, uh, you know, eat that. Uh, so this is quite encouraging that though we are moving towards technology, but the fact is technology cannot replace food. And I also want to add on, uh, again, business student always think from a business perspective and, you know, um, that the way we add LinkedIn profile in our resumes, there has to be a, you know, a reward that, hey, I have been eating healthy or I have been sharing. There has to be a kind of system uh, created wherein you are rewarded for your good, as you said, Dr. Brian, people of goodwill. There has to be a system wherein you can tell that, okay, I'm not only educated, but I'm also a person of goodwill. I eat healthy or I, you know, I believe in nutrition or I believe in uh, uh, sharing. So these were, uh, you know, the thoughts which were coming as I was listening um, both of your lectures. And also, um, Taylor, you mentioned that everything starts from, you know, earning money. The more you earn, the more you are able to afford. So I think employer also plays very important role in encouraging healthy eating. Um, it was a little bit shocking for me when I came from India to Canada that lunch breaks in Canada are not paid. So most of the time, there are people who work hourly, they do not take lunch. So I think a lot of changes uh, from the employer perspective is also um, you know, required so that food does not become uh, just to stuff our stomach, but we are also need to be um, you know, sensible that what we are putting in our body. So that's that's what is my, um, you know, intake. And thank you so much for leading all of us in this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, Shubi. Uh, I'm very impressed with your thank you. And Betty, I'm very grateful and impressed with your introduction. Uh, I would also just like to acknowledge that there was a question that I missed that came in on the chat. I've just seen it now, and I'll, I'll throw it out there. Uh, do local grocery stores generally donate their past due products to food banks or other organizations? What are your thoughts on this? Um, it is getting really late, and uh, rather than all of us get into it at this rate, this rate, late time, why don't we have an excuse to meet again uh, with this group that Dr. Brian talked about? And maybe grocery stores can be a part of the solution. Uh, and uh, as you say, in our own backyard. Um, with that, I would like to thank you all on behalf of the Father Greg McLeod Lecture Series for your presence here tonight and for 
uh, all of you who have, have hearts that care for our neighbors in need. There are many people in need and it's amazing what just one person can do. So you may be that one person and let's just see how this evolves. Thank you so much for your presence.